My name is Ryan Lurie. I'm a father of uh, six children. I have a beautiful wife. I was born and raised in the uh, city of Flint, Michigan, a city where two thirds of the children statistically here either end up in a gang or prison. Um, it's a very, very poor community, very under budgeted. And uh, we've dealt with a lot of different crises in this area. And so at a very young age, I found myself hanging out with um, hate groups, hanging out with different gangs from all different types of ideologies. And eventually, uh, coming back from the military, I found myself very, very broke, a very bad situation. And so uh, being there, I found myself drawn from my uncle and other um, elements towards a hate group that was just kind of growing at the time um, and making a name for itself called the Rolling Wood Skins. Before that, it was actually called the Buick City Boot Boys. They had kind of put themselves on the map where there was two men that had actually murdered. They like to call a Jewish infiltrator at the time. And because of that, it was statewide news. It made nationwide news. And Ron, who was the president of that organization at the time, was the person that brought me in and kind of started to teach the hate rhetoric to me that, you know, at that time I'd never heard before in my life. So I, w I was with this hate group for some time. Um, I got into some trouble because in order to keep an organization like that running, you have to commit crimes, to gain money, do different things that way. And so I ended up getting drawn in from another group of guys that was there to steal boat motors. And we were selling them and giving them a part of the money back to the organization. And then part of it, we were able to kind of keep for our own pockets. And Doing those crimes, I will say now, is probably one of the best things that could have ever happened to me in my life because it, it allowed me to separate myself from those groups. I got caught and I went to jail. During that time, I started to really have a self kind of look at myself. When I first got to jail, I thought I had to play the tough guy role. Let me show my tattoo. At the time, I had a swastika tattoo on my left arm. I said, let me fly that flag. Let me you know, try to earn the respect with the guys that were in hate groups that were locked up and incarcerated. My cellmate at the time was a black man, a very, very, very um, educated black man that was an amazing person to this day. And I say he was sent to me by Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian, but I believe the good in all religions. So I was jumped while I was there. I had a newspaper article that had went out about the organization that I was part of. And when that newspaper hit, um, I was jumped. And while I was being jumped, I looked over and I seen people from that, from those hate groups that literally were just watching me get my head kicked in. The only person that came to my aid was my cellmate, a black man, was there to protect me. And I said, wow, like this is okay, this is different. And so from that point forward, I went to medical for a little while. I came back and he really started to talk to me about, first off, how did I ever become part of a hate group? Because he just, he didn't see me as being that type of guy. And so we had a lot of good conversations on that. But he really talked to me about how, you know, how we look at everybody as human beings first and how everybody, he, he called everybody his brother and sister. And I thought that was great because eventually some of the books that he had me read from Dr. Cornell West and Angela Davis and different people, they all say the same exact things that we are all brothers and sisters in a human world and we all make mistakes. And so it really helped me to begin my transformation and my healing process and what was needed to go out into the world. I started to read, I started to educate myself, I started to get involved in the community. I started to look at why were the reasons that I ever joined a hate group in the first place? Why was I in the position in my life now when I could have been in college, I could have you know used my GI Bill to do something greater. Through my education, through my transformation, it took a lot of counseling. It took a lot of counseling sessions. It took a lot of spiritual sessions, you know, believing in a higher power and that there was a greater good and a reason for the things that had happened to me. That took a few years before I actually decided to get myself involved in some type of politics here locally. A lot of these groups, especially hate groups, start to look for people that are younger, their teenage years. And so I said, what is it that allows these teenagers to want to even go to a gang or to a hate group, to an extremist group in the first place? So I said, what can we do? Idle hands are the devil's playground. And I brought this team of people together that had worked specifically with especially youth. And we said, what is a program that kids in this area are really attracted to? Well, boxing had always been a gigantic sport here in the state of Michigan, but also in Flint. And so we've seen kids being really drawn to these programs. Well, at the time, UFC, MMA, all these things were really on, on the rise. And so if these kids were already drawn to some type of violence, how could we take that violence and turn it into more of a, a structured program that actually taught discipline, taught self-discipline, and how we were able to re-educate them on why those things that they were doing before were the wrong ways and how these types of mixed martial arts and things like that can actually be used to, to help your soul, to, to free yourself from those chains and to realize that 
you have control of your body, you have control of your soul, and you don't have to listen to somebody else when they say these type of things to you. And it also helped to give them an outlet of somewhere where to go. So we didn't just do mixed martial arts. We did a lot of different classes, family structured classes. They could come in and we had people that tutors that were there that would sit down. We had a smoothie and a shake machine area that was set up. And all these people were volunteers at the time. So what we started to see happen very, very quickly is we went from about 10 kids into just a little over 100 kids in a very short period of time. We started to get kids that were actually involved in probation or already were caught up in what I like to call the school to prison pipeline. We started to talk to those kids and their probation officers started to come around and want to see what our program all was about. We started to work with the juvenile departments, not only in the county that I'm from in Genesee, but we started to also work with Shiawassee County. And one of our biggest things that I, after we had seen how much of a, you know, a benefit these kids were receiving from this, we said, okay, what can we do to really make sure that this keeps kids from going into, you know, the prison system? What can we do to make this a stop for them and to let them know that they have hope? This is not the end of their lives and the trouble that they've been into. And so we started to really concentrate on that, on the, the judicial side of things. Now, the sad thing is, is that we know that groups and organizations like that a lot of times become underfunded. And so um, our program did get shut down because the church got shut down. And sadly, um, it was very hard for us to find another space, especially a space that large that we needed. And to get the grants that were possible at that time, just, it was almost impossible. But I said, what can I do to make sure that organizations like mine are receiving the funding that they need? And what is going on that's keeping these organizations from receiving the funding? And so I started to get involved in politics. And right around that time, um, we started to come into what was the Flint water crisis. So um, I got involved heavy, heavily when it comes to that. And I started to look at environmental issues and how they impacted racial issues too in our state. My politics kind of took a road towards that. One of the biggest things that I uh, put a fight into was the marathon industries here in the city of Detroit. I started to look at why isn't the government doing something to have more oversight over these, these companies and realize that a lot of it had to deal with systemic racism. Uh, institutional racism, what they called the white flight. So it really, really kind of started to play into myself. And I said, look, I was already doing a program where we were helping kids pull themselves out of going into gangs. And I wanted to be able to continue to do that more too. So I started kind of working on two fronts. I started working with a group that was kind of going in and they were doxing a uh, hate group. And I said, well, I could use that to benefit and help these people. And so instead of, you know, doxing them myself, I said, how about you guys let me know who these people are, who these groups are, where you're seeing the movements and things like that play on. And that I'm going to reach out to them. I know how to talk to these people. One of the things I started doing, not just by myself, I had a few people that were helping me to kind of keep an eye on things that were going on, really helped to push me out to, to not be scared to tell my story. For a long time, I was afraid to tell my story. I was afraid of being condemned by the community that I was part of. And by telling the story, I realized sitting down with people that were in other extremist groups, that I was able to show them that you can change your life. It's not the end of the road. You don't have to believe in these ideologies and I was able to kind of, to listen to them. One of the problems I always had is that I felt like nobody ever wanted to listen to me. That's why I was a loner. And so I realized by sometimes just listening and shutting up, I was able to really hear why they felt the way they did and then use that to, to counteract it. But by loving these people unconditionally, we were able to change a lot of people because of that. And so that's where I've really centered myself around now and working with organizations like React. I'm still helping out volunteering with Michigan United at times. I've been able to work with national organizations like People's Action and working not just on environmental issues and how they impact race, but also using those same things for self-interest to show people that they are very strong, that that love is what we are born with, not hate. Hate is taught and it can be untaught and you can be re-educated to be amazing members and successful people in society. The control delete program is just amazing. Everything that I've read up on it is exactly what I've been doing and what other groups that I know have been doing. And it works. It really does work. The control alt delete shift, all of that. What it does is like I've said, it, it centers around understanding and not condemning. One of the first things that we cannot do is condemn somebody for the rest of their life for the mistakes they're made. And I've noticed how this program doesn't do that. Any of the shape shifters that I've seen that are in this or involved, they don't condemn people. They try to help people heal and from a more holistic approach. And I've always noticed that healing is the first process. And I see that working with this type of program and doing it from a collective approach where you have more than just one person. You have a collective of different people that are all coming together to do this within their communities. I believe in coalition building, and I think that that's exactly what this organization is great for. It's probably one of the best programs I've seen, especially using the acronyms that they use. And it's very interesting in a world now that we're in a very you know technological world. So I, I've adopted that program. I'm very, very happy, and I see it being something very successful.
To combat hate, I talk about understanding first. Looking at a human being as a human being and then understanding each other because I think a lot of our the biggest problems in society today is that we just don't give each other the time to understand why that person had that perspective in the first place. What was the trauma that they had been through that had caused them to join these groups? What was the socioeconomic issue that maybe was in place that caused them to join these groups? But we never ever really in this country had the time or ever gave the time to say that we are human beings as equals. We didn't start this country off as an equal country. And so I think those are a lot of the issues that we have to deal with. We have to deal with healing. Healing is first for any of us to get out of those type of groups. Well, the country itself needs to heal too. You know, we don't ever have conversation about the fact that people were lynched in the South, that people were being killed by hate groups at those times, and that there has been this constant divide in this country that we've never just taken the time to understand each other. And why did we ever become the country that we are today? I think one of the main things we need to do is, is reaching out to these organizations. And one of the things I see happening all the time, especially nowadays, is that everybody's so caught up in this I, 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 or me, me, me world that we don't ever give somebody else an, op an opportunity to speak and say what they have to say. If we constantly condemn each other or it's only our way or the highway, we're never going to come to some middle road of understanding as to why we're even in the position we're in. And so I think first is listening, listening to what the other side has to say, understanding why we've got to the place that we've even got to, and then moving forward with the healing and re-education. Re-education is something that we don't see a lot in this country or the world. There's a lack of funding when it comes to a lot of education. And so I think being able to re-educate people, let them know that there is hope and that there is change is the only way that we're ever going to see real actual progress when it comes to combating hate in, in America and, and abroad.